I speak to you in the name of one true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. At the peace, I will tell you what went on at Dias and Council here in Waco. It is my custom to divide up my sermon and that news so that you can be appraised of all the wonderful things that happened this weekend in Waco. Our gospel today is about sin. It is about temptation, which reminds me, of course, of a story. Fotil walked into the living room wearing a brand new Sunday dress. Boo, she said, you spend money on fishing. You spend money on hunting. So I decided to spend money on this beautiful new Sunday dress. And it was only $400. Boo Joe protested, $400 for a dress? She said, look, Boo, I was in the dress shop. I saw this dress. I tried it on. And suddenly, the devil himself appeared. And the devil said, girl, that dress looks so good on you. Buy it. And I said, no, no, no. It's too much money. Get behind me, Satan. So what happened? Well, that old devil got behind me and said, girl, it looks good from this angle too. And there you have it. Sin and temptation. Lent is that season where we stop and we can reflect on our sin. How does sin impact our lives? How does our sin impact others? How does our sin grieve God? Not too long ago, a priest was asked to see a man found guilty of murder, sentenced to life in prison. The priest was asked to see this man, and over the course of the visit, the priest heard about the life of the murderer. It started out innocently enough. It spiraled out of control. First, there was a little temptation. Temptation that was given in to. The temptations became greater. The sins spiraled out of control. A life of personal indulgences given over to depravity. From a simple kernel of temptation, a man became a notorious killer. Each day he lived his life in sin until one afternoon, He took a life. That's how sin works. We're tempted. But who are we tempted by? God? Well, that's a mistake we often make because what do we say in the Lord's Prayer? Lead us not into temptation. Pope Francis, commenting on the change of the prayer made in the French Catholic Church, pointed out, God does not tempt us. The translation we've all grown up with isn't adequate enough in our modern language. Now, the prayer has two forms. Go back to Matthew and Luke. And we know the ending of that prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. That was added by a translator who decided we needed not to end on deliver us from evil. Surely Jesus said it. It was put in. Most theologians believe it was a later addition. But this phrase, lead us not into temptation, is interesting. Pope Francis said, the Greek that was used to make that prayer come alive for us could have been rendered for our modern ears, don't let us go into temptation. Don't let us go into temptation. Francis said, it's not about me falling into temptation. It's I who falls. He's pushing me, and he's not. God never pushes me towards temptation. So as to see then how I fall. So if not God, whom? Francis explains, no, well, a father won't do that. A father will immediately help you pick yourself up. Satan is the one leading you in temptation. 
That's Satan's task. Theologically, Satan is that concept of evil, perhaps a voice that says, sin, just this once. Perhaps it's an explanation that we give ourselves to justify what we do. Maybe it's an aberration of character. Perhaps it is a decision made on the spur of the moment. But in the end, it is us, we alone, that cause the temptation to be realized. Giving in to that side of us is giving in to our broken humanity. C.S. Lewis's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Love that book. You've got the white witch who takes Turkish delights, enchants this box of candy, gives it to Edmund, and says, eat. It's enchanted. It's delicious. It's addictive. He will literally eat himself to death because he cannot stop himself. That is C.S. Lewis's way of saying, this is sin. We take a bite of it. It's delicious. And we go back for more. And finally, we get to that point where we can't stop ourselves. We become addicted to sin to the point it will destroy us. So where's the good news in all of this? The good news is, if God does not lead us into temptation, but God helps us stay out of temptation, then we have to understand it's God who gets us through temptation. It is God that redeems us from temptation. It is God that brings us back from destruction. It is God that forgives us. Go with me full circle back to that prison. See this man spending his entire life in a six by ten cell. Return to that man who made an impulsive decision that was a result of not reigning in temptation. It started out much like a thief. I will climb in the window and steal the watch on the dresser. And then the next time I will break into a window, steal the watch on the dresser, and perhaps rummage through the dresser drawers. And then soon I will break through the window and I will open the back door and park my car behind it, because now I can rob the entire house. And pretty soon it's simple to break into a window, steal the watch, steal everything there, until the homeowner confronts, and the thief pulls the trigger. The man in the prison uniform, chains around his waist, sits in front of the priest, shares his life of tears and frustration, and then finally asks, the question he's been wanting to ask the priest for the last two hours. If I spend my life behind these walls, will it be enough for God to forgive me? And he hears the priest say, no, it is not enough, my son. Then what, Father? The priest said, God did not lead you into temptation, nor does God desire to punish you within these walls. These walls that you are imprisoned within, they are your debt to humanity for murdering someone. They are your sentence from your fellow human being. And what does God want, asked the prisoner. The priest said, God wants your sorrow. God wants you on bended knee to say, forgive me, and truly, truly mean it. At that point, the prisoner fell to his knees and begged God's forgiveness. Nothing will ever make the murder right, he cried. Nothing will restore that family, he yelled. And then he said it all. I am sorrowful, I am a sinner, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. God did not open the prison doors that day. That man to this very day is in a six by ten cell, serving his debt to humanity. But he is forgiven, 
And one day, when the earthly coil is released, the kingdom will be his because God gave a contrite heart forgiveness. If God can forgive a murderer, surely God can forgive you and me for those sins we have committed, if only we ask in our deepest sorrow with a true penitent heart. This Lent, remember, it is God that will get us through our temptations. It is God that will redeem us from temptation. It is God that will bring us back from destruction with his forgiveness. After all, he forgave a penitent murderer. Surely, he can forgive our petty sins. Amen.